This is the 10th and last lecture in this course on antibiotics. It will cover a collection of unrelated final topics. The learning objectives for this lecture are, first, to understand the general principles and the trends in determining appropriate duration of antibiotic regimens. Second, to be familiar with protocols for giving pre-procedure antibiotic prophylaxis. And third, to be familiar with antibiotic lock therapy, including its indications and contraindications. Despite it being an essential decision in the treatment of any infectious disease, I have not yet spoken about how one determines the duration of antibiotics. This is not because the uh, question or answer is complex, but rather because many times there is no specific right answer. We often just don't know how long antibiotics should be continued for in a specific patient. Where recommendations and guidelines touch on the issue, they are based on a combination of animal models and clinical trials, but largely rest on expert opinion. With a specific patient, there are many considerations which may alter duration. They include the severity of illness, the more ill the patient, the longer the prescribed antibiotic regimen typically is. Second, the speed of recovery once antibiotics are started. Although antibiotics are usually begun with a specific course of therapy in mind, it actually may make more sense to revise course based on how fast the patient appears to respond. Physicians don't typically do this, but a good argument could be made for prescribing an antibiotic course of a number of days after resolution of symptoms and or signs of infection, rather than prescribing an antibiotic course based on a largely arbitrary total number of days. Next is the bacterial species involved. Certain species have been found to be more challenging to treat, more likely to recur following short courses of treatment, and more likely to be associated with occult metastatic seeding. Common bacteria typically justifying longer courses include Pseudomonas and MRSA. The presence of comorbidities is also frequently cited as a consideration. The most common scenario in which this comes up is when a physician suggests that a patient's frail condition is a reason to be, quote, conservative with antibiotics, implying either a longer than typical course and or broader than typical choice of antibiotic. I really don't understand the choice of language here when someone refers to this as the uh, conservative approach. Clinicians often forget that the same patients who are at, at greatest risk of harm from undertreatment are at the greatest risk of harm from antibiotic side effects such as renal failure, drug-drug interactions, C. diff colitis, and promotion of antibiotic resistance. Therefore, in my opinion, excessive weight is frequently given to this consideration. Next is the choice of antibiotic. The most obvious reason would be that bactericidal antibiotics presumably act more quickly to rid infection than bacteriostatic. Also, some antibiotics can penetrate certain organs or anatomic structures better than others. The ability to achieve source control is very important. In general, when one chooses to adopt an arbitrary duration of antibiotics for a specific infection, Day one of the antibiotic course should not be counted until the day that the source of infection is under control. That may mean the day that an abscess or empyema is drained, or the day that a piece of infected hardware is removed. Finally, the certainty of diagnosis is a factor that is usually under-considered. For example, if one suspected a patient had bacterial pneumonia, but he or she could also easily have a viral URI, a formal statistical assessment of the risks and benefits of antibiotic treatments would conclude that the patient in question should be given a shorter than typical course. This is often not done in practice, largely because physicians are not adept at this type of mathematical analysis. Likewise, if a patient was known to have MSSA bacteremia, which would normally be treated for two weeks, but endocarditis, usually treated for four to six weeks, could not be completely ruled out, an appropriate treatment duration should fall somewhere in between the two. In practice, most physicians would consider treating for the full four to six weeks for presumed endocarditis, even though risk-benefit analysis would conclude this was not the most logical course of action unless endocarditis had actually been diagnosed. There has been an interesting trend over the past 50 years regarding the standard of care when it comes to the duration of antibiotic treatment. Instead of providing you specific diseases, here is a rough approximation of what's happened for seven hypothetical infectious conditions. 
As time has passed, the typical durations for some have stayed roughly the same, some have gone up and then down, and some have gone down then up. But overall, the trend has been towards shorter and shorter antibiotic courses. As you can see with hypothetical condition F, there are even conditions now that were previously treated with antibiotics in which antibiotics are no longer recommended or considered standard of care. It's interesting that this very broad and general trend is continuing to this day. I am now seeing medical health staff treating community-acquired pneumonia for as short as five days, whereas during my medical training, I would have risked reprimand for prescribing any course shorter than 10. I wonder if, in another 10 or 20 years, courses will be even shorter than they are today. So what are the typical durations of, for antibiotic courses today? I've compiled a list here of the most common conditions on the adult medical wards. The durations listed represent a synthesis of professional society guidelines, recommendations from the Sanford Guide to Antimicrobial Therapy, relevant articles from UpToDate, and my own personal experience. This list is not intended to substitute for the expert opinion of an experienced healthcare professional, and patient antibiotic courses for a specific individual should be tailored based on the considerations I listed uh, two slides ago. Meningitis is typically treated for one to three plus weeks. Conditions in the lungs, we have community acquired pneumonia, five to seven plus days. HCAP caused by neither Pseudomonas nor MRSA is seven plus days. HCAP caused by Pseudomonas, about 14 days. HCAP caused by MRSA, 14 to 21 days. Empyema, two to four weeks. Uh, remembering that from a few minutes ago, day one of that two to four weeks should be no earlier than the day the empyema was drained. In superficial diabetic foot infections, where the risk of osteomyelitis is low, one to two weeks. In deep diabetic foot infections, where the risk is high, four to six plus weeks. Sinusitis is five to seven days, a recent decrease from 10 days a few years ago. Uncomplicated bacteremia due to gram-negative bronze is typically treated for one to two plus weeks. Uh, this is also a slight change from a few years ago when it was extremely unusual to treat for less than two weeks, um, and I personally still treat for two. Uncomplicated bacteremia from gram-positive cocci and no known deep focus of infection is two plus weeks. Uncomplicated bacteremia from gram-positive cocci and a known deep focus of infection, four plus weeks. A deep focus could be something like a deep abscess related to the bacteremia or superlative thrombophlebitis. And now that I'm thinking about it, uh, probably I wouldn't call either of those situations uncomplicated bacteremia after all. Endocarditis gets four to eight plus weeks, depending upon the isolated organism and presence of hardware. Shock of unknown etiology in which cultures are negative is typically treated with antibiotics for seven to 10 days possibly longer if the patient remains hemodynamically unstable. Within the GI tract, uh, bacterial gastroenteritis can be treated for three to five days and sometimes with no antibiotics at all, depending upon the suspected pathogen. Uh, SBP gets five days, longer if abdominal pain persists or repeat paracentesis shows a persistently elevated peritoneal neutrophil count. Diverticulitis gets 7 to 14 plus days, and C. diff gets 10 to 14. Within the GU system, an uncomplicated UTI in a female gets 3 to 7 days, and on rare occasions is treated with a single dose. A UTI in men or a catheter-associated infection in either sex gets 7 to 14 days. Pyelonephritis, 7 to 14 days. And acute prostatitis gets a surprisingly long 4 to 6 weeks, as a consequence of suboptimal prostatic penetration of many antibiotics, as well as the potential for forming microabscesses in the prostatic tissue. Finally, in the other category, cellulitis with seven to 10 days, septic arthritis in the absence of hardware four weeks, and osteomyelitis in the absence of hardware six plus weeks. In a patient who was initially started on multiple antibiotics, or on a single very broad antibiotic, how does the clinician know when to narrow antibiotic coverage? In general, an antibiotic regimen should be narrowed as much as possible once the etiologic bacterial species and antibiotic sensitivities are known. However, some types of infections are known to be frequently polymicrobial even if only one organism grows in culture, 
in which case the clinician may want to keep coverage very broad. Examples of these situations include deep diabetic foot infections, in which only a single organism grows in wound culture, or an empyema, which only grows a single organism. In the frustrating event that an organism is never identified in a suspected bacterial infection, there is no one correct strategy to guide how to narrow antibiotic coverage. Some clinicians will continue treating broadly until the end of antibiotic regimen completely. Others will take an approach which employs empiric stepwise narrowing. What does empiric stepwise narrowing look like? Suppose, for example, a dementia patient from a nursing home who was previously infected with an ESBL strain of Klebsiella presented with severe pneumonia, which could have been a healthcare-associated pneumonia or possibly an aspiration pneumonia. Possible etiologic microbes would therefore include ESBL, MRSA, and anaerobes. Therefore, the initial empiric regimen should include coverage for all of these. Suppose over the first four days of treatment with this regimen, the patient steadily improves, but unfortunately by day four, the patient's blood and sputum cultures are persistently negative. A common approach to narrowing and eventually discontinuing the patient's antibiotics might look like this. On the fifth day, the regimen is narrowed by discontinuing the antibiotic targeting the least likely pathogen, which in this case uh, might be considered to be the anaerobic coverage. Presuming the patient is still looking better the next day, the anti-ESBL coverage is DC'd, and if he or she looks well still the day after that, the last antibiotic is DC'd. Um, the actual order is, is not terribly relevant, this is just an example. And the idea here is that if the patient worsens after any change, it implies that the change should be reversed. The problem is what one should conclude if, for example, the patient worsens here, about 24 hours after the last antibiotic was discontinued. The quickest conclusion would be that it was the discontinuation of the anti-MRSA coverage that was the problem. Unfortunately, the half-life of that drug may be long enough that it's still in the patient's system, and even if not, it might still take more than a day or even more than two or three days for an incompletely treated infection to recur. Therefore, while it could potentially be the discontinuation of the MRSA coverage, that was the problem, it could just as easily, and perhaps even more so, be the consequence of this narrowing step, or this one. In the end, we cannot know. Therefore, in the absence of new data, the most appropriate course of action would likely be to restart all three antibiotics and go back to square one. At this point, I'll switch topics to discuss antibiotic prophylaxis. Routinely giving antibiotics prior to many types of elective surgical procedures has been shown to decrease surgical site infections. Antibiotics are only one of many means of preventing surgical site infections. Other essential practices include preoperative skin cleansing with chlorhexidine or iodine, use of barrier devices by staff in the OR, such as masks, caps, gowns, and shoe covers, surgical hand hygiene, and good general surgical technique. Antibiotics should be given about 30 to 60 minutes prior to surgery in order to ensure maximum drug tissue levels at the time of first incision, though some advocate for vancomycin and quinolones to be given closer to 60 to 120 minutes prior. The choice of antibiotic given depends upon the type of procedure, as different procedures expose patients to different pathogens. For example, most procedures can be classified as what I, I call clean, transcutaneous procedures, such as upper GI tract, elective orthopedic, neuro, and cardiothoracic surgery, along with pacemaker and ICD implantation. In these procedures, Staphylococcus, usually Staph aureus, is the most common pathogen leading to surgical site infections. Therefore, the preferred regimen should obviously target Staph. The preferred prophylactic regimen is Cefazolin, for patients with a severe type 1 allergic reaction to penicillin or patients who are at unusually high risk of MRSA infection, vancomycin is an acceptable alternative. In colorectal surgery, the surgical site will be exposed to a much broader variety of microbes, essentially anything that lives within the lower GI tract, which includes enterogram negatives, enterococcus, and anaerobes, as well as staph from the skin. Therefore, a prophylactic regimen should be much more robust.
Preferred choices include the second generation cephalosporins, cefoxetin and cefotitan, the combination of cefazolin and metronidazole, which does not have great coverage of enteric gram negatives, or the combination beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor, ampicillin, sulbactam, marketed in the U.S. under the trade name Unison. In patients with penicillin allergy or high risk of MRSA, the combination of VANC, aquinolone, or astreonam, plus minus metronidazole can be given. In oral surgery, mouth anaerobes are the major concern. Clindamycin alone is a good choice and can be given to patients with a penicillin allergy. Other options described in the literature include cefazolin plus metronidazole and ampicillin sulbactam. Finally, in high risk, that is non-routine cystoscopy, and any transurethral or endoscopic procedures involving instrumentation of the ureters, enteric gram negatives are the major concern. Therefore, either ciprofloxacin or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole are used. Although increasing quinolone resistance in E. coli in some parts of the world has led many internists away from using this class as empiric coverage in UTIs, this concern has not yet translated into changing practice among urologists. It's possible that this has not yet been found to be an issue with post-operative infections in neurologic patients, though with a continuing increase in worldwide use of quinolones, this may become more apparent in the near future. While everyone agrees with the importance and benefit of prophylactic antibiotics immediately prior to the procedure, an importantly and frequently overlooked question is how long to continue them after the procedure. There are two basic situations seen in common practice. In the first, no hardware is being implanted, for example, an apodectomy or hysterectomy or something similar. In this case, antibiotics are continued at the usual dosing interval during the actual procedure and may or may not be continued for up to 24 hours after the procedure's conclusion. This is usually at the personal preference of the surgeon and there isn't great evidence or guidance as to whether any post-operative antibiotics are necessary. In the second situation, hardware is left in place after the procedure. For example, a pacemaker or ICD implantation, a vascular stent, or orthopedic hardware. It's fairly common, though not uniform, for an anti-staphylococcal beta-lactam to be prescribed for up to seven days post-procedure. The first-generation cephalosporin cephalexin is a common choice here. However, there is generally no evidence for this common practice, and no major guidelines suggest it. That's not to say it's necessarily a bad idea, but at this time it's not clearly established to be a good idea either. An important point is that none of this preceding discussion applies to procedures related to traumatic injuries. Surgeries immediately following trauma are usually considered to be dirty procedures where the risk of surgical site infections is significantly higher and thus surgeons are much more likely to prescribe broader antibiotics and for longer. An important subset of patients requiring antibiotic prophylaxis are those who require prophylaxis specifically against endocarditis. Patients with certain complex cardiac conditions may have an increased chance of endocarditis following procedures that can result in transient bacteremia, for example, a tooth extraction. The possible transient bacteremia associated with this procedure is usually of minor or even trivial concern to most patients, as our immune systems can clear it before the bacteria have a chance to seed anywhere. However, there are some patients who are at a particularly high risk of seeding intracardiac structures even when the bacteremia is very brief and of low bacterial load. These high-risk patients include those with intracardiac prosthetic material, which includes valve replacements and some valve repairs, but excludes coronary stents, patients with a prior history of endocarditis, patients with unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease, and those with valvulopathy in a transplanted heart. The types of procedures which have potential for transient bacteremia include dental procedures more involved than routine cleaning, various procedures of the upper respiratory tract including tonsillectomy and transbronchial biopsy but excluding flexible bronchoscopy without biopsy, GU instrumentation, ERCP, and colonoscopy with biopsy. In general, the concern is the combination of the high-risk patient and procedure causing transient bacteremia 
with a couple of caveats. First, significant transient bacteremia from GU instrumentation is now thought to be less common than previously, plus most bacteria found in the GU tract are enteric gram-negative rods, which very rarely cause endocarditis. Therefore, a GU procedure is only considered significant when the patient concurrently has an enterococcal UTI and eradication of the infection should be attempted prior to instrumentation. Similarly, with both ERCP and colonoscopy with biopsy, while they can result in transient bacteremia, the risk of this is low and the bacteria that translocate into the bloodstream are usually not the same species with a predilection for heart valves. Therefore, these are no longer considered part of the indications for prophylaxis. What agents are preferred? For high-risk patients undergoing either dental or respiratory tract procedure at high risk of causing transient bacteremia, the preferred choice is a single dose of amoxicillin, 2 grams orally, given 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure begins. Alternate choices include cephalexin, azithromycin, and clindamycin. I'm going to cover one final topic in this course, which is antibiotic lock therapy. Catheter-related bloodstream infections are very common and are difficult to treat because they are associated with a microbial biofilm on the catheter surface. Routine systemic antibiotics may be unable to penetrate the biofilm, leading to recurrent catheter infections. Therefore, the conventional strategy for these infections is simply to remove or replace the catheter. Unfortunately, in some circumstances, the patient may have severe IV axis problems, and the catheter may be a long-term line such as a tunneled catheter or a port, which both patient and physician may be very reluctant to remove. Antibiotic lock therapy involves installation of very high concentrations of antibiotic into the catheter lumen in order to penetrate the biofilm and allow salvage of the catheter. Indications for this are considered to be the presence of a long-term intravascular device, infection due to either coag-negative staph, a non-pseudomonal gram-negative rod, or vancomycin-sensitive enterococcus, and hemodynamic stability. Contraindications are a short-term intravascular device, such as a routine triple lumen central line, which should just be removed, infection due to staph aureus, pseudomonas fungi, or mycobacteria, severe sepsis and or hemodynamic instability, metastatic infections such as endocarditis or a distant abscess, or an extraluminal catheter infection such as a pericatheter abscess. Antibiotic choices include cefazolin, ceftazidime, vancomycin, and gentamicin. Once chosen, the antibiotic is generally combined with heparin as this is believed to promote biofilm penetration. The final antibiotic concentration should be greater than 1,000 times the MIC of the organism. Protocols regarding the dwell time, that is how long the antibiotic is allowed to sit inside the catheter lumen, range from 4 to 72 hours. The 72 hours is reserved for patients on hemodialysis as this is the typical maximum duration between hemodialysis sessions. The evidence supporting antibiotic lock therapy is very limited though in one meta-analysis, lock therapy plus systemic antibiotics was associated with a lower risk of catheter replacement being required over systemic antibiotics alone. Any patient who is persistently febrile and or bacteremic after 72 hours of treatment should be considered a lock therapy failure and have his or her catheter removed. So that concludes this lecture on a few final topics. To end the course, let me put up this list of 12 key considerations when prescribing antibiotics. We first saw this list in the course introduction, and I wanted to remind you of how far we've come in three and a half hours. I hope you found this course interesting and useful. As always, I welcome any comments, questions, and feedback. If you haven't already done so, you may want to consider subscribing to view my other videos on a variety of medical topics, such as EKGs, ABGs, cardiac auscultation, and mechanical ventilation.